All right, we're having fun. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Am I on? Or? There might be a good thing to you. So welcome to worship. Welcome to the great adventure that is life with God. And I hope that you will take some time during the service to read the announcements and the bulletins. Some of them will be reinforced, but they're great opportunities for us to uh, to be in ministry over the next two weeks in particular. We welcome those who may be watching online, for we live stream our services every week, and uh, we hope that the Spirit of God is as real as present where you are as it is where we are this morning. And we want to lift up... Um, those who are web sponsors today in honor of Rosemary Scott's birthday. Woohoo! From Kelly, Joe, Courtney, and Dylan. Happy birthday. And uh, in honor of Nancy White's birthday, which was last week, and they celebrated uh, Dan and Bill White's in honor of Nancy's birthday. Happy birthday again, Nancy. Woohoo! Good morning. Let's turn to each other, greet one another, and say God bless you. Welcome and good morning and uh, as you make your way back to your places uh, or found a new person to sit by, that would be just as cool. We, we begin with prayer, but first to celebrate a couple of things. Do you notice there are no stars in the sky on that screen anymore? Yeah. Got fixed, well really, almost by 9.15 this morning to some degree, but... Uh, Thanks to Tim and uh, Andy, and especially Patrick, for the work they did to make sure that's possible. And and you're uh, allowing us to do that as we use some of that money we gave vote for last uh, fall to make that possible. As uh, And now we actually have a tabletop projector we can use for presentations if we ever need to use one around here that's available. So God is supplying. God is good. All right, let's try this in. God is good. God is good. All the time. Good. That's right. Yeehaw. Good. Amen. I love it. We want to lift up the family of Dorothy Durfer who, who's passed away on Thursday. And so we want to hold her in our prayers, her family, especially uh, George Anderson, who is Tom's brother. His complications from soldier, shoulder surgery. And we want to keep George in our prayers. The Crouch family whose grandmother's in the hospital with a stroke. Uh, they lost their mother last year, the day after Christmas. So uh, not only them, but many people have a difficult time this year because of the loss of loved ones this year or in years past. And that, that brings to my mind the, our attention on these two candle tables. Um, we did this last year on this Sunday because this Sunday, of course, is the two-year anniversary of the Sandy Hook tragedy in Connecticut where all those beautiful young children's lives were taken. And uh, I'm inviting you, if the Spirit moves you and uh, you want to light a candle uh, in memory or asking for God's grace and peace for your life or someone else to come forward at any point in the service and light a candle, in some ways, we're thinking about children, people who may have lost children, and not just through tragedies like Sandy Hook. Maybe at some point in your life, uh, your family suffered a miscarriage, or some way you, you lost the child that was close to you. Now, last year we did this, and we mixed the uh, old school candles with the new school LEDs, and someone made the mistake of lighting the LED candle, and it flamed up. <laughs> Thankfully, there were people who were aware of it and put it out. So we separated them this year. <laughs> That's right. So that is lit by a taper. And this one is lit by a little button on the bottom. 
And we're permission giving today. So if the Spirit moves you at any point in the service, and you want to come up and light a candle on either side, if you're old school candle, there's one. If you're new school LEDs, please have at it. And we all agree it's okay, right? Yeah. Pastor Mike can be in the middle of the sermon, and if the Spirit moves you what? Light come on candle. out. That's right, light the candle. Because we are lighting a candle in the dark. Every time we're God's people in this world, and especially for any of us who are going through a difficult season, for not just the loss of children, but the loss of anyone close to us. So the candles are available. If the Spirit moves, come on up. You won't interrupt me. You will actually be asked, inviting God to grace us in His presence. With all of that, then, let us pray. The candles, oh God, remind us that in this season of hope and peace and love and joy, as we anticipate and our hearts grow bigger in, in anticipation of the celebration of your birth in our lives in Jesus, that we live in a often way too broken world where people make decisions that have terrible consequences. We light the light this morning that we may stand with you, O Lord of all creation, lighting a candle in the darkness of a broken world. We light candles this morning, O God, to stand with you to, to cast light in the darkness of grief and sadness, of loneliness and despair and depression. We light a candle that we may cast the light of healing and hope for our neighbors and our friends who struggle today with, with finances that that don't meet the needs with marriages that are just being taped together to get through the end of the season and then fall apart for, for good. For neighbors and friends who, who don't even know that you come as light in our darkness. You come as, as love in our lovelessness. You come as, as joy when we think all around us it is as dark and as gray as a, as a winter's day. You come as salvation when we think there's something we have done, some thought we have carried, some, some burden we have had oppress us that forever would prevent us and keep us from being loved by you. Your love is limitless. It is showered upon all people. So we pray for those in need of healing and lift their names to you today. We pray for those in need of hope. We lift their names to you. <clears throat> we pray for those in need of joy. We pray for marriages that are breaking, for relationships that are unreconciled. We ask in the name of Jesus that His salvation and His peace and His love would take over our lovelessness and restore us to your favor and to your blessing. And we thank you most of all for the gift of salvation that we know we live with a, 
a confidence that nothing in life or death can ever separate us from your great love and the forgiveness you pour out for us in Jesus. Nothing can prevent us from turning to you. This we ask in the name of Jesus, the Christ, our Messiah, and our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Gordon and Joe, when you come forward and lead us in the Advent candle, I did this thing two weeks ago, so forgive me for forgetting ahead of myself. to be here with my wife Joan this morning to uh, uh, light the candles. Uh, the season of Advent helps us to uh, be prepared. It then helps us to remember the limitless gifts that are given to all people. And we walk with Jesus. And as the light of the candle of Advent wreath, and as we light these uh, lighting, we find that uh, this week, let us remember how one act becomes one more act becomes another act and then again breaks through the darkness with kindness, mercy, peace, with love, and with joy. We, fir we first lit the first candle of Advent, the candle of hope. Because God has come to live with and among us in Jesus, we hope God breaks in all the life with the possibility of a new birth. Last, we, uh, last week we lit the candle of peace. So we'll light the candle of peace. After we lit the candle of peace, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is close to us again. The light shines in the darkness. Peace is not as hard to find as we thought. Today we light the candle of love. Today we've lit the candle of love. In the Bible, Matthew remembers the appearance of the angel to Joseph in this way. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her, in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins, and all this will take place to fulfill what has been spoken by the Lord through the prophets. Look to the virgin, shall be received and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. The Bible tells us that it is because God loved the world so much that Jesus came. 
Love is the highest expression of the presence of God. And God is with us. The scriptures remind us there is not a place on earth that stands outside of God's love. I chose uh, one other uh, scripture this morning that uh, as I started out as a young person, uh, it became one of my favorite uh, uh, scriptures, and that is 1 Corinthians 13, that goes on to uh, talk about love. And as, uh, as you find it, as you grow in the wisdom of love as a young person, uh, you find that uh, uh, God is with you. And uh, it has been one of those most impressive parts of my life. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and with of angels and have not love, I am nothing. And it goes on and on. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have the faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to the feed the poor, and though my gift I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not believe rudely, does not seek its own, it is not provoked, think no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there be tongues, they will cease. Whether there be knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is part will be done away. For when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child. But through as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now just as I also am known. Love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. This I give you as a prayer. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice, for your give, for your loving, to uh, showing your example by suffering upon the cross for us. We thank you for your mother Mary, and for Joseph, for the gifts that they have brought to the world. We thank you again, Lord, that we are blessed today to uh, offer these gifts through lighting of the candle and to offering our love for one another. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
But we're still hungry, God. For the word you have to offer, for the love you have to share, for the hope you pour out, for the peace we need in this world and in our hearts. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts introduce us to your personal life-giving word today. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, um, Facebook, right? By the way, if this really annoys you, it's okay. <laughs> God's like that with me sometimes. Um, Facebook, Thursdays, right? It's usually called Throwback Thursday, right? Throwback Thursday is when people like to post some old pictures of themselves or their family, you know, Throwback Thursday. So, in honor of, and, and the title of my message is, I think Jesus is Throwback Jesus. That he takes us back to the real heart of God. So in honor of Throwback Thursday, uh, I thought I would take you Throwback Mike Whedon style. <laughs> and there's our family picture. And uh, can you tell which one's me? <laughs> I'm actually the one on the left. The good looking one. <laughs> Don't let my brothers hear that. Now there I am. Look at that hair. <laughs> Is that awesome or what? Yeah, senior prom, baby. <laughs> And there it went. Oh, right, there it's going. That's college. And then uh, young 30s with uh, my, I don't know if that's Elizabeth or Chris, to be honest with you. But uh, some of my throwback Thursday experiences, you know, look at that good looking guy. But you notice I'm wearing a hat. You know I'm wearing a hat, don't you? Because there's very little growing on top of my head by that point. Jesus is God's throwback to the heart of God for us. And when Mary sings in her piece about how the one growing in her room will bring down the mighty and lift up the lowly and will fill the hungry with good things and send the rich away with empty hands, she is expressing the heart of God from the beginning of God's connection and relationship with God's children. Let me give you two or three examples or images to hold with you, besides a balloon over your head, about how this is true. First, the notion of the temple versus the tabernacle. Now, that's Old Testament, old school kind of thinking. The tabernacle was this kind of portable tent. And the temple and the tabernacle were, were ways in which the Israelites understood that God was present with them in their culture and in their community. So first it was the tabernacle, this portable tent uh, surrounded by a, a, a fence of billowing cloth. And the tent signified the presence of God among God's people. But it was portable, so when the Israelites moved, the tabernacle went with them. When God said, let's go over here, the tabernacle went with them. As they went from wilderness to the promised land, it was the sign that God was with them at all times. It moved. Where they were, there he was. Then there was the notion of the temple. Contrast that, if you will. On the highest mountain, Jerusalem, made of solid stone and beautiful columns, colored covered with gold and, and walls which divided up the inside so, so that only certain people could get closer to what they call the Holy of Holies, the place where they truly felt God dwelt. This solid place, it wasn't moving. It was a whole different understanding of who God is. As they, as they talked about God, the, the temple didn't go to people. The rules and requirements of their faith was, you went to the temple. God didn't come to you. One is settled and fixed. The other moves. One is attractional. That is, we have to go there to find God. The other is missional or incarnational. It goes where the people go. One sees God and God's people as settled and stuck in their means. The other sees God's people as on a journey in the wilderness going from one place to another. Mary's 
recollection and praising and song about this baby growing in her belly recaptures the heart of God in other ways in Isaiah, excuse me, in Ezekiel 34, there is this contrast between the shepherds of, of Israel and, and how God felt called to, to be Israel's shepherds. Now the shepherds was that Old Testament language for the leadership, for the pastors and the mayors and the governors and the, the kings, the leadership of Israel. And what God said to God's people by the time of Ezekiel was he was against the shepherds. And the reason God said He was against the shepherds was because they didn't feed the hungry. They didn't help loosen the chains of injustice. They didn't provide for the poor wandering without shelter. They didn't clothe the naked. And because of this, God said, I am against the shepherd. But He says, instead of the shepherds, I will be their shepherd. God says, I will be their shepherd. I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak, but the sleek and I will destroy. And I will search for the lost and I will lead back the strings and I will look for you. Jesus is throwback Jesus representing and expressing the heart of God even farther back. In the Bible, to the very first book of the Bible in Genesis. Remember the story of Adam and Eve after they ate the apple, right? And their eyes were open. And what did they do? Who remembers? They hid. hid Because they felt remorse, they felt guilt, and they felt ashamed. They realized of all the things they're capable of, and all the things they're capable of as human people full of possibility and sin. The very next verse in Genesis chapter 3 describes God walking in the garden of the cool of the morning, but He's doing more than taking a stroll. He's actually calling out for them. He's looking for them. Where are you, Adam? Where are you, Eve? He's looking for them. Even in their sin, even in their shame, even in their guilt, and even in their brokenness, God is moving towards them. That is the heart of God, my friends. Moving towards us. And the point of Mary's song as she celebrates and praising God for the child growing in her room is that the Magnificat, which we call this portion of Scripture where where she is singing, makes clear that this is the pattern of God's activity. Jesus is the throwback heart of God. Jesus is the expression of the heart of God. Jesus is God's promise to rewrite injustice and and create places where oppression and anxiety and racial balance and racial bias are overcome by love and forgiveness and grace scattering the proud and raising the low Jesus is God moving toward you and me it's the love of God that keeps pouring out and never and it's limitless I found myself getting angry this week. I found myself getting angry as I thought about these these calls, these promises, this movement of God, this desire of God to create a people of justice and mercy and love and forgiveness and grace. And and then I contrasted what I was reading and, and imagining with what I was hearing and reading in the news just from the Congress. I was angry. Because someone had slipped in wording in this bill that they passed last night, it turns out, that gave permission for the banks to once again gamble with our money. They're called derivatives. And what the banks do is they gamble with money. They make bets on whether mortgages will fail or not fail, or whether they'll make them money or not make them money which is something they did in 2007, except now they have permission to do it again. 
And the person that put this in the bill, they have never identified. They say it was written by lobbyists for the banks. What that means is your deposits that are insured by the federal government, if they make, if they have any losses, guess who pays for it? We do. Because that insurance is the money we pay in our taxes. I found myself angry this week because they passed a part of the bill that says that you can now give more to support your political candidate of your choice. Instead of $2,000, it's now up to $10,000. I don't have $10,000. What that usually means is the people with means now have even greater and wider path to access and influence in the halls of the government that is supposed to represent all people. Where is the raising of the lowly in something like this. I was angry because the whole issue of torture came front and center. I was angry because the report that came out was highly partisan. Didn't take into account all points of view. Didn't take into account the reflections of members of the CIA who are supposed to have a part in this process. But I was angry because it reminded me that this is something we said was okay to do. And I know in this room there are people that may have a lot of differences of opinion on the use of torture when we're worried about our national security. I get that. I honor that. But I'm a follower of Christ. And I'm a citizen of this country. And I kept asking myself, is this what Jesus would do? Is this what Jesus would do? He was tortured. So that we wouldn't have to live like those who tortured Jesus. But mostly, you know, I found myself mad at myself. Because this went on 14 years ago. I didn't stand up. I didn't write my congressman or my senator. I didn't make a statement about who I am as a child of God. I just kind of looked the other way while this was going on like most of Americans did. <coughs> Instead of standing out for the call of Jesus. So I was mad at myself. This is who I'm called to be, and yet discovering again, this is who I am. And yet, there's Jesus. He's walking in the cool of the morning garden. Mike! Mike, where are you? Uh, Jesus, Jesus... I did it again. I know. Mike. But I'm not done with you yet. We're not done with this yet. For today, for right now, it's okay. Let's just sit and be together. And he, he keeps coming. He keeps forgiving. He keeps offering me second chances. Not because he doesn't care about what I do or that my actions make a difference or not. Not because he comes to me like he's a permissive parent that always turns the other way when, when the parent's kids do something wrong. Instead of creating boundaries of discipline that teach a child right and wrong so that they can be a positive moral agent in this universe, he keeps coming, as the hymn says, with risen with healing in his wings for you and for me. And he keeps coming with unlimited love that we may help him scatter the proud, raise the lowly, and to tweak our conscience because he's enlisting us for an invasion of love. And I'm glad he does. What about you? So then that last question that often comes, you know, okay, Jesus has come and uh, Mary says he has fulfilled these things, so they, they're happened and they are happening, then, then how come so much is left unfulfilled? How come there's so much more work left to be done? How come it's not taken care of? And I want to answer this question by telling a story, the story of Todd and, and Loa Mayberry. It's a story told by Adam Hamilton. Adam Hamilton is the author of many of the books we use for our group studies. 
And uh, he's a pastor of United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas. Probably the largest United Methodist congregation in our country. Over 10,000 people on a weekend worship at their Leewood campus site, but they also operate or minister in multiple sites in Kansas. And he talked about when they called Todd and Laura Mayberry to their ministry in their downtown site in Kansas City, Missouri. It's probably God, so it's okay to answer. In downtown Missouri, on the edge of the highest poverty concentrations in Kansas City. He told about calling them from Duke Divinity School, right? Duke Divinity School to this congregation on the edge of the inner city in Kansas City. He said, I can imagine that when they moved here and were looking for a house, the real estate agent probably said this, you move west of Truce. It's an avenue in Kansas. Don't move east of Truce. Because if you move east of Truce, it's a more dangerous area, there's more crime, and the property value of your house will undoubtedly fall. And he says, there's something about Todd Mayberry that when someone guarantees him that he should look east of truth, that's exactly, he shouldn't look east of truth, that's where he will go. Now, Adam Hamilton grew up in Kansas City, and here's how he describes that area of town. He says, when he grew up, the things people told him is, you never go east of truth after dark. And he says, you never go east of prospect even in the daytime. So guess where Todd and Laura bought a house? East of Prospect. They were the only white family in a three-block area of their community. They talked about their neighborhood. They said there was a black couple across the road that, they, that befriended them and, and said, you don't have to buy a security system. They said, because my husband and I, we sit in front of our picture window every day, and we'll watch over your house and make sure you guys are taken care of. We are the best security system your money could buy. He said, the other neighbors on the other side of us made us feel like infants as followers of Christ. They have one biological child, he said, but they raised 18 children out of foster care in their home. They described how the people in their community welcomed them. They became neighbors to them and loved them. They were at first a little bit confused what they were doing in that neighborhood, but they welcomed them as neighbors. Todd and Laura Mayberry, against all the advice that they had heard, chose to move in the community because they wanted to break down barriers, they wanted to tear down the walls, and they wanted Kansas City to look more like the kingdom of God. They wanted, as followers of Jesus, to imitate exactly what God has been doing from the beginning of God's relationship with us. Coming to, being with, going where the low and the weak and the marginalized are so they and we would know the incarnate love of Jesus. And that, to me, is the answer to the unfulfilled part. You know, if, if Jesus is creating an invasion of love, then he needs an army, doesn't he? He needs people, like you and me, to, to join in this effort. He's taught us, that's what the New Testament, especially the Gospels, taught us how to love, what, what the ethics are for this invasion of love, how we're to live, how we're to forgive, how we're to love with grace and, and forgive even our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And then he says, after teaching us, he says, now go and do likewise. Love, not just as a feeling, but love as a way of life, a way of being. Express the heart of God in this world. What is keeping you from that? What is your block? What is preventing you from being God's incarnate love in your neighborhood with your neighbors?
with your friends, with your co-workers? <clears throat> Who do you need to love today to express God's incarnate love? To be part of that invasion. To be throwback Jesus in the communities in which we live. Let us pray. God, we come. Sometimes we miss you. And most of the times we miss you. Help us with these 11 days to go before celebration of your birth. To focus our lives and our hearts, our families, around hope. To ponder and welcome peace. And to incarnate your love. And all God's people said, Amen. righteousness 
and the wonders of his love and the wonders of his love and the wonders of his love let us now go and serve with hope peace love and joy <laughs>